Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning to you, wherever you might be logging in from around the world. I am Rob Burgess, and I head up business development for Sino Biological. And I would like to officially welcome everyone to the next installment in our series titled Lock and Key Immunodetection Webinars. We have a wonderful and excellent speaker today from Cartera. And he's gonna talk about a very exciting technology focused on antibody discovery, as well as epitope analysis. Before I get to introducing our speaker today, I have just one very brief housekeeping issue that I wanted to mention. And that is if you have a question for the speaker, I ask that you type it into the chat box. And then at the end of the lecture, I will verbally walk through as many of those questions as possible within the chat box. So come up with some good questions for the speaker today. Also, please introduce yourselves in the chat box and tell us where you're from. It's always interesting to see where people are logging in and calling from around the world. And so without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce to everyone today's speaker. It's Dr. Daniel Bedinger. Daniel helped launch Cartera's Lodestar Array platform and now leads the company's global application science team. He has over two decades of experience in the generation and characterization of therapeutic monoclonal antibodies, most notably at Soma and Abgenix. Daniel earned his doctorate from UC Davis in cellular and molecular physiology, and it was there that he actually focused on and studied insulin receptor signaling. And the title of Dr. Bettinger's talk today is High Throughput Epitope Analysis and the Latest in Antibody Discovery from Cartera. So, Dan, it's a pleasure to have you today, and we will now turn over the screen sharing to you. All right, thank you. Let's get this shared. Okay. Hopefully you all can see these slides now. Yeah, so thank you. Good. Thanks. All right. Thanks for joining me today. Um, so we're going to talk about high throughput characterization of antibodies. So th the industry in general has sunk a lot of investment into the optimization of monoclonal antibody generation technologies. And uh, a lot of uh, organizations now have the ability to access large sequence spaces of antibody diversity, whether through you know, phage display, B cell screening, um, you know, synthetic library design, AI. Uh, and the analytical tools to accurately measure you know, binding affinity and specificity and epitope analysis for a large number of clones really lacks orders of magnitude behind. And so at Cartera, we're focused on trying to develop tools that bring the capability to get accurate analysis at more of a library scale, or at least push the throughput as far as we can um, on that, because we don't want you to throw a blockbuster candidate away. So typically, binding kinetics and specificity screening has been done on a pretty limited set of antibodies or, or clones. Uh, really due to limitation of conventional label-free biosensors, which make those large analyses either really time intensive or very sample intensive. And so typically, uh, you know, people try to compromise by either doing low resolution assays, you know, with like one concentration, two concentrations of antigen, uh, you know, limited concentrations, or uh, do significant down selection before they proceed with that characterization. But with automated array-based SPR, we call it HTSPR, and the LSA platform, you can really get high-quality kinetics and specificity characterization at a new scale, you know, typically at the types of sample levels that people get out of screening campaigns. And this can also be done with supernatants and extracts, so crude samples are often applicable for high-resolution high kinetic data in early discovery. Also, the LSA platform can dramatically increase the scale and accessibility of competition-based epitope binning, which we'll talk about quite a bit in this talk. <clears throat> so a little bit of an agenda here. So I'm going to start off talking about how high throughput SPR can enable and accelerate antibody discovery by giving three examples from the literature. Um, I'll do a brief introduction to the Cartera LSA and now LSA XT platforms and talk about how we do kinetic analysis with them 
and then talk about our process for epitope binning and, and why we think it's useful to do high resolution epitope binning and our assay strategies and analytical approaches, and then going into a little bit more detail and example of the application of that with the COVID consortium study. So high throughput, high resolution epitope binning is becoming more popular in the industry. You know, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic coincided really with the broad adoption of the Cartera LSA platform. And the, the good thing about that was that most of our antibody discovery customers were able to shift um, when the labs were shut down and things to doing COVID discovery work and still work. And there was a heavy emphasis on publication, you know, rapid publication of SARS-CoV-2 work. So we actually generated quite a body of literature around our technology. I, I guess the downside of that is that it's primarily COVID, SARS-CoV-2 related work, which you know, is great. It's, it's good, good work and good biology and some amazing demonstrations of the technology, but it's not very broad. And so, you know, we have a lot of customers that are doing a lot of great work in other disease areas, you know, all you would expect, uh, other infectious diseases, cancer, immuno-oncology, um, uh, neurobiology, um, all those things. Um, and so I encourage people to check out our symposium presentations at our website, carterabio.com, if they're interested in some other applications, because we have uh, seminar presentations of that, though, though not a lot of that work has been published. Okay, so going into the first example here, this is one we love to talk about. Uh, the groups at Abcelera and Lilly collaborated very early in the pandemic um, they had received some DARPA funding to build a you know, rapid antibody infrastructure uh, earlier. And when the pandemic came about, Abcelera collected blood from one of the earliest recovered COVID patients in Canada and did a B cell discovery effort where they identified many putative uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike binder antibodies. Um, they expressed uh, many of those, and in the sort of the first tranche, they moved 187 small scale expression clones into uh, Cartera LSA analysis. So both Lilly and Abcelera had LSAs at the time, and they did uh, this work kind of in joint. And so in seven days, they were able to characterize all of these clones for affinity and kinetics, ACE2 competition. Um, which is, you know, neutralization of viral entry, essentially, you know, in vitro setting, and uh, full symmetrical pairwise competition epitope binning. So they were able to identify the highest affinity neutralizers from a broad epitope diversity. So they could select, you know, key clones from individuals uh, or with unique epitope properties. From that, they took 24 into their manufacturability assessment and also downstream potency assays and into and then triage that rapidly into manufacturability and production. And they were able to actually file an IND for bamlanivimab 90 days after uh, the start of getting those B cells from the patient. And uh, at 94 days, they were actually in the clinic with that. And Bamlanivibab went on to be get receive emergency youth author, authorization in, uh, I believe it was October of that year, making it the first biologic COVID-19 therapeutic available. So this really shows, I think, kind of the, uh, the apex, you know, it's definitely the fastest a biologics therapy had ever been developed at this point. And it really shows, you know, what is achievable if uh, companies have the right tools in place. You know, Lily has a very sophisticated um, characterization and developability paradigm that they were able to move these things into. And, and the LSA was a key part about accelerating that initial phase. Another example I'd like to give is a publication from a group at NIAD. Uh, this was Josh Tan's group, and they were also making SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing antibodies. And they found they had about four discrete communities of neutralizing antibodies against the RBD and one discrete community against the NTD domain of that protein that showed potent neutralization. 
And in some early sort of cocktail studies, they realized that they were only seeing additive potency and not synergistic, but they were more uh, interested in something that would have a real high neutralization with synergy and maybe some different specificity that would give some variant resistance. So they looked into making biparatopic sort of bispecific DVD IGs. And that's this, this format shown here where you have a, an IgG construct with two independent binding domains tethered to the end. So by using this understanding of epitope binning, they were able to, in the, the potency infinity relationships Anders said, they were able to design a discrete set of these biparatopic molecules to take into characterization, knowing that they bound to you know, non-competitive epitopes with each other and should have some uh, bispecific function. Uh, when they characterized those, they found some really interesting examples of synergy. The one shown here was the most potent, where you can see um, in black the potency of the pooled version of the two, or the pooled test of the two clones. And then the biparatopic or the other two curves, those are replicate data showing more than 100 fold shift in potency uh, with the, the biparatopic activity. They did some cryo EM work to try to understand why this was so potent. And they found that there was a really interesting cross-linking created by the RBD. So this, this set of clones was actually one of the NTD binders and an RBD binder. And it would cross-link across two neighboring spike monomers and lock the uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein into an extremely inactive conformation. So this was... Pretty cool application of that. And the, the last example I'll talk about here is on actually a different disease. It's still uh, antiviral. Uh, Tom Wuhan and the group at Twist uh, was looking at ways of validating their platform and demonstrating just how efficient it could be. So Twist has the ability to generate large amounts of synthetic DNA. So they went to the literature and found a paper that had published, you know, a couple hundred or I think more than two hundred sequences to, of uh, patient-derived Ebola-recovered patient antibodies that they believed were Ebola uh, viral protein binders. So in, in about 14 days, they expressed all of these sequences, cloned them into expression vectors, and started making small-scale, you know, one mil transfections of these. In another about four days, they purified those antibodies and were able to run them on the LSA for you know, general kinetics of binding, although you know, it's a trimeric antigen, so it's avidity, but at least characterized binding and a, a, a binning assay. So they used uh, about a little over 50 analytes and they included a number of clones that bound to known residues in, in the literature. And so this enabled them to actually map all of the sequence diversity they pulled out of the publication in just a couple of days to either known binding epitopes or identify them as binding to unique, you know, sort of previously uncharacterized epitopes. So this is a really strong validation of how in, in a very small amount of time you can go from sort of unknown sequence space to a fairly high resolution understanding of the binding properties and epitope of these clones. And this could be used to design, you know, cocktails or bispecifics going forward. Okay, so now I'm going to actually introduce the LSA platform itself. Uh, the LSA is an array-based SPR biosensor and it's been pretty widely adopted by the instrument. It launched in the beginning of 2018, and now it's in 19 of the top 20 pharma, many biotechs, uh, numerous CROs, and uh, multiple reagent suppliers. So we actually have two instruments now. We have the original LSA and a sort of updated version called the LSA XT. I'll talk a little bit about the differences later on. Then we have our software suite, which is three software packages. The Navigator software is our instrument control software used to design experiments and collect data. Then we have two analytical software packages. One is called Kinetics and one is called Epitope. It's relatively self-explanatory what they focus on. And then we have an entire line of biosensor chips and consumables that you can use to run the assays. So the LSA really excels in many of the core applications of 
you know, biologics or antibody discovery, those being kinetics and affinity analysis, competition-based epitope binning, peptide or mutant mapping, and quantitation. And so in addition to having a hardware architecture that makes these assays uh, very high throughput, scalable, and sample efficient, we've put a huge amount of effort into developing analytical software packages that make processing these large data files like uh, fast and efficient, but also visually rich with lots of tools to access uh, different types of figures and images to the, uh, around the data. The way the, way the platform works is it has two semi-independent fluidic systems within it that address the same chip. So the chip doesn't move, it sits in the center of the instrument. There is a 96 channel flow head where you can flow 96 samples at once and you can use that to index to four locations uh, within the surface to create a 384 spot array. And then the single flow cell will dock over that entire array area and flow one sample over everything. We call this one-on-many analysis. And it's where the really high levels of efficiency uh, for both kinetics and epitope binning or generally uh, multiplex studies uh, comes in. So a little bit more resolution on uh, this process. So this is a video showing the 96 needles descending into the sample deck and drawing you know, 96 samples at a time. This print head device docks onto the chip surface and flows the samples back and forth before returning them to the plate. And then it can go pick up additional samples, go to a new location and print 96 more, eventually creating a 384 spot array, which is actually shown in the picture now on the screen. Um, so it's a high, high density array. There's some real advantages. We call this continuous flow microspotting technology. And, and this is kind of our core uh, differentiator. Um, unlike most microarray systems where you're depositing material on the surface. This is actual flow. So it's going from running buffer to sample and back to running buffer. So all of the types of workflows that are done on conventional biosensors can be done here, where you're either immobilizing from low concentration samples using electrostatic pre-concentration, or you can capture from crude samples if you have an affinity surface. And because we're flowing the sample back and forth, we can maintain a high flow rate for very long contact times. You know, if you have a B cell supernatant with tiny amounts of antibody in it, and you want to capture your antibodies for 45 minutes onto an anti-FC surface, for example, you can do that and, and allow the surface to build up uh, over time. So we get really high sensitivity that way. And it's quite flexible with chemistries as well. Um, this is just a view of how the array kind of works. Uh, the pink vertical rectangles are the 96 channels that are docked. The blue horizontal ones are the 48 interspot references. So those are unprinted locations used for real-time referencing. If you do four of these prints from above interlaced, you create a 384 spot array shown below. Um, so the other fluidic module here is the single flow cell. So this docks over the entire area where the array can occupy and flows one sample. So this can be really useful for preparative steps. If you're going to regenerate the chip surface or immobilize, say, a capture of a lawn, we call it a lawn when you coat one sample over the entire surface. Um, it can, is also used to deliver the samples for kinetic injections or competition assays like epitope binning. So that one injection is giving you simultaneous data for all really 432 spots on the array, the 384 active plus the 48 reference. Um, so this is one 270 microliter volume of this uh, injection to get you data in all those parallel spots. Again, it cycles the sample back and forth. So with that relatively small bottle volume, we're able to maintain a high dynamic flow rate to minimize things like transport effects. So again, with the single flow cell, one sample goes over everything collecting parallel data. Just real briefly, I wanna talk about our chip types offerings. Um, much of the chemistries people are used to using on biosensors are available through us. 
Uh, this list is kind of always expanding as we learn and develop new applications, but currently we have a couple different thicknesses of linear polycarboxylate chips, several different carboxymethyl dextrans, including a planar. We have nickel NTA surfaces for capture of histag proteins, several different thicknesses of streptavidin and protein A and protein AG chips currently available. Okay, with that, we'll start talking about high throughput kinetics and how we approach this. So in, on the right is a, a diagram of a very common uh, format for capture kinetics, high throughput screening assay on the LSA. So this shows uh, an anti-human IgG surface. This would be made using the single flow cell as what we call a lawn. So this is everywhere. And then you would use the 96 channel side to capture supernatants or, or even purified antibodies diluted uh, to the surface via their FC. Or, and this could be you know, any type of antibody fragment or construct that has some sort of affinity linkage, you know, biotinylated peptides or aptamers, uh, FABs, uh, VHHs with his tags or HA tags. You know, we, we do all those things. And then this single, oh, and that uses tiny amounts of sample, you know, way less than 100 nanograms per clone is necessary. Uh, then you inject a titration series of your target with the single flow cell. Um, and the example I'm going to give on the next slide, it's PD-1, it's a 17 kilodalton protein. And to generate a titration series starting at one micromolar, it used seven micrograms of antigen. So very little material for the amount of data you generate. This assay, because this is a regeneratable surface where you can remove the bound ligands, can be scaled all the way up to 1,152 unique ligands in a run. Our instrument has positions for three 384 well plates on the 96 channel side. And so you can repeatedly um, load those samples to the array and uh, strip them off. So you can even automate, say, like three antigens by 384 well plates. It's only nine steps in, in a run. <clears throat> um, yeah. Oh, and you can use this to capture high N or dilution series of ligands as well. So you can get high quality data in, in one go. This is uh, an example of a run that was done on the LSA, uh, set up in an afternoon, run overnight. So 384 interactions. Um, in this case, it's actually only about 38 unique antibodies spotted in 8 to 12 uh, semi-replicates each. Uh, that's why you see the repeating patterns. <clears throat> but all of this data, you know, this was the, the analyte injections you're seeing are uh, eight wells on a 96 deep well plate. So it, it used seven micrograms of antigen to generate all of this. Some cool software features are shown here. So we like people to report accurate results with the LSA. So we do uh, some flagging and um, annotation of the experimental results as they come out. The ones shown in gray are non-binders that are below a threshold you set in the software. So in your big list of kinetic rates, um, those would just say NA. If they have a poor fit, a high error, uh, they are flagged in this case in yellow. And then there's two kinetic limitations shown here as the same color, although they could be set to be different colors. If there is a slow off rate that is hitting a limit that you define in the software, um, it will flag that and report it as uh, uh, you know, less than function. The affinity is less than 50 picomolar. Off rate is less than 2e times 10 to the minus 5, et cetera, based on what your settings are. Also, if you haven't injected a high enough concentration of analyte to necessarily accurately uh, inform the R max or, um, you know, the saturation point, it will flag that. The, technically, it's, it's flagging something that the observed binding level is less than 50% the calculated R max, but you can think of it as highlighting to you that if you are going to, you know, hang your hat on those affinity and on rate values that you might want to inject a higher concentration of antigen. It will give you those rate constants, but it flags them for you. So I mentioned earlier, with if you don't have 384 things to mobilize in your array, you can increase your N. So this is a really common thing that's done on the LSA is instead of just getting one value with a goodness of fit parameter, uh, 
um, you can actually get mean and standard deviation of uh, equivalent uh, analyses. Um, this is showing one clone in 12 replicates within one experiment. It was actually captured from three slightly different dilutions is why you see the three densities. Um, but if you label them with the same name, the software will automatically calculate mean and standard deviation of all the rate constants and parameters from the fit. This could be a really powerful way if you're looking at subtle changes like single amino acid mutations or maybe a deamidated form, you know, an ion exchange peak of an antibody prep. If you spot it in 12 times at, you know, multiple different densities and you run the same injections of analyte over those two preps on the array, you know, you can look, do my error bars overlap or is there a real difference in the kinetic behavior between those two forms? This is a pretty powerful application of the technology. In terms of visualization of this data, um, the, the software has some great tools. This is an ISO affinity plot where you have the on rate as the Y axis and the off rate as the X axis because the affinity or KD value of an interaction is the off rate divided by the on rate. These diagonal lines represent single affinities. So you have uh, 100 picomolar, or 1 nanomolar, 10 nanomolar, or 100 nanomolar here down these lines. Um, and you, this, so this is a great way to visualize kinetic distribution of the antibodies in your panel. In this case, uh, some of the clones are highlighted to show all of the replicates that were um, done. One more example on the LSA of kinetics I want to show is, was presented at a, one of our seminars by Denisa Foster from Eli Lilly. They had, were making you know, COVID-19 antibodies, and this is actually the bamlanivimab fab form binding to immobilized or captured uh, SARS-CoV-2 RBD mutants. So using a shallow well, 96 well plate, they were able to do small scale transfections of many mutants, take those soups, directly capture them to the array, and in an afternoon, get the full kinetics of the fab profile to all of these uh, 96 mutants to the receptor. Um, so I think this is a great example of both crude kinetics and also sort of the richness uh, of data you can get easily on the LSA platform. So I did mention earlier, we have a, a new version of the LSA. We're calling that the LSA XT. So the same story applies to it as that we like to say about the LSA, you know, you can get a hundred times the data, 10% of the time using 1% of the sample compared to uh, other leading biosensors. Um, but now we have uh, better than two times signal to noise. Uh, two times better signal uniformity in the array and two and a half times faster data collection rate. So what this really translates to is it's the same fluidic system as the original LSA. It's, you can think of it as just enhanced optics and uh, you know, some software improvements that make processing the signal data better. Um, the LSA was really well suited and all of the data you've seen up till now was from the original LSA for protein-protein interactions, antibody screening, affinity characterization. Um, but it was a bit of a struggle for really small analytes or extremely rapid interactions, things that dissociate very quickly. You know, we could get an affinity, but maybe not a rate constant or things that were very small um, or harder to measure. You'd have to get higher surface densities to stay above the noise structure. So the XT sort of brings this to a new level with the faster data collection rate, a little better referencing and uh, much less noise. So we can do things like kinase inhibitor profiling. So the, the next couple of slides will show some assays where six kinases were coupled to an HC30M chip in duplicate. Um, and we injected kinase inhibitors from three micromolar and threefold dilutions. And this is done in some 3% DMSO buffer. So this is starosporin. This is a 466 Dalton compound. So, uh, you know, for us, very small. And you can see we can clearly elucidate the kinetics to these different uh, kinases. Uh, the results match the, the specificity and the binding rates that we'd expect to see from the literature. Uh, 
another one, uh, Sunit Nim. This is a 530 Dalton interaction. You can see it has a quite different specificity profile. But again, we're able to characterize both the kinetics and the affinity of these interactions. So we're very comfortable with the LSA XT saying that analyses down into about the 500 Dalton range are, are totally doable. And there are some applications where using the array in this one-on-many format makes a lot of sense, like kinase inhibitor profiling. Um, another application uh, that we've been working with on the LSA XT is FC receptor binding. You know, some of these, they're not small proteins, so it's not a signal limitation, but they do have a rapid uh, dissociation. So the faster data collection rate of the LSA XT makes this nice. It's also a very high throughput. You can put down many FC receptors into the array and inject your antibodies of interest and collect all that data in parallel. So this greatly speeds and significantly reduces the materials required for these assays based on the experiments um, our customers were doing in the past. Um, also, uh, I will mention Sinobiologicals has a, a quite robust, I think about 30 FC receptors, uh, many of which are biotinylated in their catalog. So that's probably a great uh, source to build an assay like this. So this is just some data. These are um, 11 human and sino uh, FC receptors spotted in eight replicates each. So each row is the replicates and each column uh, contains the different receptors as you go down. So you can see we get really good agreement across the replicates. We're able to accurately measure both rapid and high affinity, you know, so low affinity and high affinity receptors. And this is everything you're looking at here, if you remember, is one injection per concentration of the antibody. This is trastuzumab. So very little analyte is required for these experiments to generate such robust data. If we zoom in on the data, uh, you can see we're able to get really nice fits for both subnanomolar and micromolar interactions. Okay, and with that, I'm going to switch to talk about epitope binning. So why do people want to do epitope binning? You know, the, the function and the mechanism of action of therapeutic antibodies is linked to its epitope. The affinity of an interaction can be pretty readily assessed and engineered or, or optimized, um, but the binding epitope is innate. And it, it's you can't take a, an antibody typically that, that binds to one epitope and mutate it to bind to a different one. That's really kind of the core part of what that antibody is. And so early epitope characterization can serve as a surrogate for functional diversity. You know, sequence diversity is one thing, but you can have a fair amount of sequence space that reflects a limited epitope space. So it's good to verify that in addition to sequence diversity, there is epitope diversity, in a, in a, especially in a new discovery panel where there's interest in multiple MOAs or maybe combinations by specifics, cocktails, things like that. You can also use high throughput epitope binning data to inform large sequence sets. You know, say you did a campaign where you ended up with 3,000 putative binding sequences. You can probably use bioinformatics to organize those into family trees where you know clone sequences are. are relatively related. So say you took 300 relatively unique sequences and ran a full-scale epitope mapping or epitope binning experiment, you could then bucket a large portion of that sequence diversity into expected epitope space. It can also be used to identify sandwiching pairs or establish IP if there's uh, you know, uh, publications or uh, you know, patents around certain binding profiles and epitopes. You know, the more clones you include, the more likely you are to show a difference. So the assay setup for epitope binning on the LSA <coughs> me, scales linearly. So if you add one more clone to the assay, it's one more well on your ligand plate and one more injection of analyte and sandwiching antibody in the final assay. Uh, most other platforms, if you try to work out the logistics uh, of scaling these pairwise competition assays, they scale sort of exponentially in complexity and, and typically are limited around you know, 20 to 30 clones maximum. 
um, where on the LSA, we can scale all the way up to potentially 384 by 384 in one automated run. I'd probably recommend breaking it up into a couple where you have a 384 spot array and you only do 180 ligand or analyte injections for each one and then merge those files together. But uh, those are kind of details. Uh, but this generates a huge amount of data. Uh, if you were to do a 96 by 96 competition binning assay, that's over 9,000 interactions. If you did 384 by 384, that's almost 150,000 interactions that would show up in your heat map. So each unique interaction can be thought of as a probe. You can imagine if you have four antibodies and you bin them together, you can tell whether they compete with each other but you're not going to have very good resolution about whether there's any subtle differences in that. But if you have a diverse set, so you have 96 antibodies that bind to a wide range of epitopes, you start to uncover subtle differences between them based on their shared competition profiles. Because each antibody that you inject or use in the assay can potentially reveal differences in the others. So... Uh, the LSA epitope binning workflow is kind of outlined here. The, the process starts by immobilizing the clones onto the array. And then we have two assay formats that we typically use. The one on the top shown here is what we call the premix format, where you inject either the antigen alone or the antigen in the presence of a potential competitor antibody. And if it can sandwich, uh, you, you know, you see additional binding. If not, it will inhibit the binding. This is really useful for multivalent analysis. If you have, uh, you know, a dimer or a trimer antigen, this is the preferred format. If you have a monomer, you can use the one shown on the bottom, which is called the classical binning assay. And this is where you inject the antigen and then subsequently inject the sandwiching antibody and look for a gain of signal if you have uh, a sandwiching interaction. So once those experiments are run, uh, the, we have analytical software where you define cutoffs and thresholds, and then the software will automatically make and sort these heat map and these network plots that show how the epitopes relate to each other of these clones. A little bit more on the, the binding cycle here. So this is be a classical binning cycle where you have a baseline followed by an antigen injection. Then there's the green bar is actually a normalization bar where it scales the binding of that antigen to one. So if you were to have, say, some loss of surface activity over time or some variance there, it still allows you to set global cutoffs because it does a normalization. The second bar um, is a report point bar, and it's looking at sort of the average value of the signal under that bar, and that is what is used to populate the heat map, and it's actually the difference from the blue control injections. Um, so even if you have dissociating uh, antigen, you can still uh, set cutoffs for that. And then it allows you to position cutoffs and everything that crosses the report point bar in the green is a sandwicher. Everything that crosses it in the orange is a blocker. And these can be adjusted on a per ligand basis if needed. So the, the analysis software interface is shown here for the epitope binning. And this is really powerful because you have three views that are all interrelated. So there's a sensorgram view, there's the heat map view. So immobilized antibodies are rows, injected antibodies are columns. If they're sandwiching, they're green. If they're blocking, they're red. And if they're self versus self, they have the dark outline. And then we have the network plot. In this plot, every clone is a node, a circle, or a square. Um, if they're competitive with each other, there's a cord connecting them. And if they have the same competition profile, they're clustered into one of these colored epitope bin regions. And these three plots are interactive. So in this case, this cord was clicked. It highlights the cells in the heat map related to that relationship and shows you the sensorgram. So this was an asymmetrical uh, interaction. So this allows you to dig you know, deeply into your data, explore the relationships in the heat map and the network plot, and see whether you, know, you believe all these calls or if you need to adjust your settings to properly interpret the data. This is really an enabling uh, feature to work with these large data sets. So I mentioned the bin network plot, where if the clones have the same competition profile, they're clustered into one of these groups. Another thing the software does 
automatically when you sort these heat maps is it generates a dendrogram. So this shows the level of shared competition profiles across clones as you go up. There is an option to set a custom community threshold where you can define basically an arbitrary cutoff height um, and define more generalized bin communities. And this is really useful. We'll talk about this a lot in the COVID example at the end. Also, there's some great visualization tools where you can color uh, your data by orthogonal data. In this case, that's showing whether or not the clones are mouse cross reactive, what library they come from, or what subdomain they bind. You can also do this numerically with potencies and affinities. And this is just sort of a toggle in the option after you load in tables of, ta tables of data. Um, one more thing on epitope binning, a, a common application is to look for sandwiching pairs. If you're doing you know, biomarker analysis, PKPD studies, or you know, looking for infectious diseases, you need to find highly efficient uh, sandwiching pairs. So on the LSA, typically in 24 to 40 hours, you can take a panel of clones, create an array, do a kinetic analysis to the target to figure out on and off rates, and then do a symmetrical pairwise competition binning where you'll see you know, which clones sandwich well together and which ones don't, and even identify which ones are likely to be more efficient capture or detections based on their behavior. And this typically translates really well to other sort of plate-based or uh, more conventional immunoassay formats. <clears throat> Okay, with that, I'm going to move on to talking about the COVIX study. So uh, this was a large collaboration study run by La Jolla Institute for Immunology, and I think it's one of the richest examples of epitope binning data being overlaid with structural data. And I, I was a part of this, and it was published in Science. Um, so the COVID consortium was a global nonprofit consortium uh, funded by the COVID-19 Therapeutic Accelerator, Bill and Melinda Gates, and, and some others, uh, as I said, run by LJI. And it involved a number of labs uh, around the world collaborating to characterize antibodies that were contributed to the consortium that neutralized SARS-CoV-2. <clears throat> um, so uh, a number of biologies like viral neutralization, uh, FC receptor interactions, viral escape were all looked at, but two of the groups, uh, Duke and us at Cartera, were using the LSA to do affinity and epitope binning characterization. Um, so about 75% of the 400 antibodies that were contributed to this study bound to the SARS-CoV-2 RBD, which is the receptor binding domain. And there was a small set uh, beyond that, that bound to either the N-terminal domain or only, you know, full intact spike. So the binning I did, and I'm going to talk about here, is for the RBD binding clones. So these clones all bound to a shared globular protein that we could express or that LJI expressed as a separate entity. Um, as I mentioned, there was an affinity component to this study. The group at Duke was primarily responsible for uh, reporting this data, you can see they generated affinities to the RBD, which was a monomer and gives discrete one-to-one -one kinetics and quite a bit of kinetic diversity across the panel from the COVID. And then they also looked at spike binding, and this is a, a trimer with some avidity. So the kinetics are slightly less descriptive, but still uh, illustrative of the binding properties. So I did a, the epitope binning of the, the entire panel. This is a representative assay from that. This is 170 ligands by 188 analytes or almost 32,000 interactions shown. This is a single experiment. And this is really the way you would like epitope binning run at this scale to look. You know, the, the matrix is highly symmetrical where you're getting equivalent competition generally in both orientations. And we're able to find some really discrete shared uh, behaviors to make some nice communities. So I'll highlight a couple of those here. So this is a community that was identified. You can see that they are competitive with each other and they share uh, many competition and sandwiching relationships. And it's generally coherent how they do it. This purple community is a, a closely related community, but it's different in that it has clones from these other, the yellow and blue community are not or sandwiching, where in the yellow community, uh, they were blocking. So these, even though these clones compete with those and they share many relationships, 
uh, due to the resolution of this assay, we're able to say this is a shifted epitope with a different behavior. And you can see you can keep going on highlighting communities that have uh, additional properties and differences. So this is how this is applied. Uh, we try to find coherent sort of breaks in the data where there's obvious uh, shared behavior. So this was done, this is the dendrogram and some community assignments from the COVID consortium. LJI did cryo-EM on selected antibodies from these various communities. Over 40 antibodies were evaluated for structure, and they found that the binding interface of, from cryo-EM was highly related to the competition epitope cluster bin. And so we sort of mapped it here on the RBD. You can see where the different uh, communities bend. The, the dotted line is the ACE2 binding site. So you can see we sort of move around various faces of that as these epitopes shift. Um, so this was really interesting, really great confirmation that these communities, if applied strategically, can really translate direct to discrete structural domains. It was interesting that there was some patterns with uh, variant resistance from the different communities. You can see the ones that are dark had uh, neutralize high new levels of neutralization. And all the way through Delta and Mu, there were clones that seemed to have real pockets in, in certain communities of, of resistance and branches on the dendrogram. Uh, as the Omicron strain developed and the number of mutations increased, uh, this became uh, hard to maintain for many of these antibodies. Uh, and uh, you can see that if we include the BA1.1 and later Omicron strains in this, that it becomes a bit more stochastic, which ones are resistant. There's still some little pockets uh, of, of resistance, but this is really high sequence diversity to expect these antibodies to bind. So out of the entire panel, um, there were 66 neutralizers that maintain uh, Omicron resistance. LGI published a second paper looking at sort of the mechanism of this resistance, and they found some interesting things in that I'll talk about in the next slide, that the clones that were antibody derived and bound to the RBD, all of the ones that had potent, potency uh, did so with avidity. They would bind to two uh, monomers of spike within a trimer, much like the biparatopic antibody that was shown earlier from NIAD. Um, there was one subdomain, RBD4B, which uh, actually still maintained potent neutralizers with monovalent binding. And it's interesting that in that area, region, where those clones bind, there's three mutations in some of the Omicron strains, two are conserved and one is right on the edge. So those clones are able to sort of bind around uh, the mutational set and maintain potency, whereas uh, the high avidity in the other ones seems to maintain some potency as you know the, the affinity is kind of enhanced. And I think there's structural uh, limitations to how the spike can move when bound bivalently by an antibody. So this is uh, another real interesting paper that came from this work. And with that, uh, I'm going to thank uh, the contributors for these, you know, the team at Cartera, uh, the folks in the COVID consortium, especially uh, Sharon Schendel, Catherine Hasty, Hua Yang, um, and all the COVID participants. Um, and I'll end with one final summary slide. Uh, you know, I think high throughput epitope binning is broadly becoming an integral part of early antibody discovery projects. Uh, epitope competition data is crucial for selecting antibodies and cocktail for, or for cocktails and bispecifics. Uh, the LSA really allows you to run kinetics at a scale um, that is unrivaled. And then I wanna thank uh, Sinobiologicals for the invitation to present today. Thank you, Dan. That was an excellent presentation. We really appreciate it. Wonderful technology, lots of great data. I'll go ahead and jump right into the questions as it looks like we're getting a little bit short on time here. The first question is from Rahela Kuisarkani. And Rahela asks, uh, is it possible to use cell lysate as a source of antigen for epitope binning? 
it's possible yeah um as long as there aren't other components in the media that are binding heavily to the surface or the antibodies um, i've actually done quite a bit of work like with kinetics with solubilized cells you know to look at membrane protein and binding thing you know if you have a mixed micelle detergent lipid you can have a high expressing cell line uh, lice it up, spin out the particulates, and then inject that as a titration series of antigen. And the antibodies should have su sufficient specificity to recognize that component. So that can definitely work. Great, great. And another question from Rahela is, can you use phage antibodies instead of actual purified antibodies for the epitope binning studies? So phage display derived, um, like, SCFEs or VHHs in, in the, the way most people make periplasmic extracts or, or bacterial supernatants tend not to be high enough concentration to use an epitope binning. Mm -hmm. You can absolutely get kinetics with them because if they have an expression tag, you can capture them to the array and inject antigen. But in epitope binning, there's a component of injecting the analyte over the surface where you really need sort of a molar concentration of that analyte high enough to drive binding. If the clones are, if your expression's good and the clones bind with very high affinity, then you might be able to get away with it. But typically if you have a diversity of affinities and a diversity of expression levels, those assays would be really hard to interpret because you might see very small binding signals in that sandwiching response. And mm. it, it, it's just due to the concentration of analyte and solution isn't high enough to drive that binding or, or block the, the binding sites in a premix assay. So typically um, you're, you're better off using either purified or high expressing samples for those things like XP293 transfection soups have plenty of antibody in them to use an epitope binning or even hybridoma soups, but bacterial extracts is, uh, tends to be dicey. <laughs> Great. Thanks for that answer. Yu Shen Hao is asking, can you perform kinetic analysis for epitope competition data? Um, not sure. I totally, I mean, those are kind of separate applications. You know, there's, uh, you know, you can look at binding kinetics to the epitopes you're interested in. Um, and co the competition studies are typically not used to interpret kinetics. Usually that's part of the same workflow, but a different set of experiments. You know, um, we do have some applications around, um, Protax, the targeted protein degraders, which are heterobifunctional molecules that are binding to two components. And we measure affinity of ternary complex formation versus the two individual uh, binary complexes. And you can calculate things like cooperativity or inhibition from those by comparing the rate constant. So that maybe that's what you're thinking. Yeah, I think that, that probably answers the question there. And Wen Guo is asking, how is a neutralizing antibody recognized by LSA? Yeah, so typically when people are doing neutralization experiments on the LSA, it's that if you're looking for an antibody that will inhibit, inhibit like say a receptor ligand interaction, you know, if you bind to a receptor, can the the ligand of that receptor still bind? Or in SARS-CoV-2, it was if you bind to that RBD or that spike molecule, can the ACE2 target still be X? So it's a pseudo neutralization study, but people do it quite a bit and it, it tends to translate relatively well to you know, cell-based confirmation assays. If you're looking at those simple sort of blocking type mechanisms, mm -hmm. obviously there's other mechanisms of neutralization that would be much harder to tease out with this type of application. Like you know, if you're dimerizing a receptor that causes it to be inactive on a cell, you might not see that if it still allows ligand binding. Great. Thanks for that. My colleague, Amy Sheng at Sino is asking, is there any buffer restriction, for example, is glycerol or trehalose a problem on the platform? Yeah, so the system is chemically compatible with those solutions. Um, you always, when you're running SPR, you need to be cognizant of refractive index mismatches between the sample 
and the analytes that you're injecting. Because if you get very large differences, we call them bulk shift, bulk refractive index shifts, uh, it can make it hard to interpret the data. But if you had samples that you couldn't rem you know, remove the trehalose in, what you would want to do is have a running buffer that matches that refractive index. And you can do simple tests by doing a buffer injection to see if you get a big response or not. So you can add you know, trehalose to your buffer or match them. Like we do a lot of experience experiments with small amounts of glycerol or DMSO or, you know, other things that do contribute refractive index. Um, but we want to match the, our analytical samples to that, especially for kinetics. It gives a much cleaner result if you can match those. Right. Uh, this question is from Raghu Sangana Gary, and it's about the, really the universality of your epitope binning software. Can that software be used with other instruments or it's only restricted to the Cartera instrument? So the software is developed, you know, to mesh directly with uh, uh, the LSA data. And it's only available to customers that have an LSA. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, there there is some capability to import um, you know, like Excel based tables of data in there and do some processing and make network plots and stuff that sometimes our customers take advantage of. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're, if you're interested in, in the technology in general, one thing I, I didn't say earlier, it, you know, if you want to see LSA data or, um, you know, try it out or learn more about the platform, you know, reach out to us, you know, you can contact us at our website and things. Jazia Shafiq is asking, how many times could a chip actually be used? So the chip has the same lag end on it, like with different antibodies. Can you do like multiple screens, I guess? Yeah, so the capture surfaces, like if you make an anti-human FC or use a protein AG or a nickel chip, they can be used quite a few times. Um, you can strip them and reload them, even take them out of the instrument, store them and reload them a, a few times, not indefinitely. Um, assays where you covalently immobilize an array of ligands, like you would do for an epitope binning experiment, those tend to be more single use. You know, it, you're, you use them, you can use them extensively while they're in the instrument, but once you sort of pull them out and make other arrays, they're, that they're kind of done, so. Right, I have a, a question here. I think everybody would be interested in. I'm just wondering if you could, Talk about the advantages of using SPR technology as opposed to plate-based technology like ELISA. I mean, why is it so much better than, than an ELISA system? Sure. I mean, for things like early kinetic characterization, you know, you're really learning a, a lot about the system, you know, rate constants, affinities, and it's easy to include things like specificity screening. You know, if you have multiple isoforms of a receptor or off-target proteins, those can all be incorporated into these initial screen runs. And so rather than sort of an iterative process where you find hits, you know, select them, scale them up, and then come back to it to try, okay, now let's understand the affinity and, and select leads. You really have all that information right at the beginning. So you can jump right ahead to sort of putative lead selection or, you know, move smaller amounts of clones into uh, downstream assays than you might otherwise be able to do. Mm -hmm. Also, things like epitope binning, you know, it scales uh, really easily on the LSA. You know, 96 by 96 binning is two plates, a plate of ligands, plate of analytes. On an ELISA, it would be like 100 plates. <laughs> right. right, just much more high throughput and uh, capable in that respect. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate that. We've run out of time. I apologize to Chunan Chen and many others who I didn't get to your questions today. Please um, email those over to Sino and we'll forward them on to Dan and others at Cartera get answers for you. Let me just go ahead and briefly thank all the attendees. We had a huge turnout today. Appreciate everybody attending. I just have to say this because it's very interesting where everybody attended from very quickly. We had folks from Egypt, Germany, of course, all across the United States, the UK, Poland, Canada, India, Portugal, Yemen, Switzerland, Iran, Nigeria, and Ukraine. So thanks for a wonderful attendance. Certainly, Dr. Bettinger, we appreciate you lecturing today under the Sino Lock and Key webinar series.
That's fantastic work. Congrats to you and congrats to the entire Cartera team on the exciting technology and the wonderful success that you've achieved. Um, well, thank you very much. Thanks for listening, everybody. Yeah, and one other person, my colleague, Max Blackman, who organized and executed this uh, talk today. Thank you for all your hard work and your efforts. It was another successful webinar. And with that, I will say uh, good night, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. And that completes uh, this week's webinar. Thank you.